Uh, next, I'd like to invite Chevy Bay. Uh, he's here from Malaysia, um, founder and CEO of BookTok, and he's going to be interviewed by Ying Ying Liu. Uh, so uh, come on, and uh, we'll get started on this. Thank you. Hey, Chevy. Hi, how are you doing? Thank you for flying in from Malaysia. Sure. Uh, was it last night or this morning? Uh, last night, late evening. Wow, he's still a little bit tired, you can tell. Um, all right, Chevy, the big news, you know what I'm going to say. All right, so he just raised half a million dollars from the royal family of Brunei, which is their first tech investment ever. Tell us how you made that happen. Uh, we were friends. I mean, I play sports. <laughs> <laughs> friends and family round, right? So you go to the first round. Actually, we raised more money than that, more than half a million, okay. north of half a million US from, from them because we were friends as I was a kid. I'm still pretty young, not that I'm old, but he saw how I was, I was previously my family business, running my family diagnostic imaging. We are the largest healthcare provider in primary and secondary care in Malaysia. And only about six months ago, I came up and did my own startup. So he saw my track record, how I have been transforming my family business, and he said, hey, what you're doing is really interesting. Is there any possibility I come in as an investor? So I said, sure, if any way you think you, you trust me, I say, sure, why not? So we, we got the ball rolling that way. Why did you leave your family business to do your own startup? I think it's nice you can do whatever in your family business, like, but there are a lot of restriction as well. And no matter how well you do something, people always ascribe because you have a great platform. So I want to prove the naysayers incorrect that you can come up and you can still do it, provided you know how the business economics work in, in the sector, if you believe in it. Just to give you guys background, Chevy previously had thousands of people working for him. And he left all of that, uh, I think, less than a year and a half ago, a few months ago. Six months ago. Six months ago to do this. And I just realized we didn't talk about what exactly BookDoc is. Do you want to tell us now? So BookDoc, when I first started, I actually wanted a whole healthcare ecosystem in the platform. So I reached out to one of my, my, my friend that I regarded him doing quite well. He was the ex-founder of Groupon and ex-CEO of Asia Bank. So he told me that I went to him and said, how do you scale up a technology business? Because when you do a brick and mortar business, typically you build a business, you see the mechanics working out, then you start expanding. But in technology, they don't care at the initial stage, you have to put up your barriers to entry really quickly and your presence being felt. So first thing he, he, he came to me because he was good at cloning businesses. He said, have you heard of ZocDoc? I was like, uh, not really. He said, Google that, it's worth 1.8 billion US. So I said, okay, so what does it do? He said, it's a booking appointment platform. So we started, being a booking appointment platform six months ago. But as we speak, I know from day one, it's not a sexy platform. So we started adding more and more services. So beyond doctors, for example, right now, we have chiropractor, dentists, physiotherapists, etc. on the platform. So besides doctors, you have all the allied health profession. And how we want to also increase stickiness. So what we do, we are not doing necessarily a B2C, we are doing more B2B. So right now we are tied with uh, about six corporate clients, collectively about 35,000 paying customers on a monthly basis, a three to five contract. So with that, we could keep perfecting our, our solution. And after that, once we have everything out and running, then we start opening up to the consumer. All right, but regardless of whether it's B2C or B2B, this is inherently a marketplace, is that correct? Yes, I would say so. So it's, a, it's actually a market, network marketplace. Can That's, you explain what that means? So, you would say that what we want to do is to be a trusted platform, not only for booking, for buying services, like another second part we are doing, we are launching end of the month, is a marketplace. So as a consumer, you always go and look at health screening packages, for example. Hospital A say this is a comprehensive screening package. Hospital B, Hospital C. As a consumer, how do you know? So what we're trying to do is to be an aggregator and put everything in a digestible format in layman terms that Package A, this hospital costs 1,000 bucks, the other one costs 900, the other 1,001. How many laboratory tests, how many diagnostic tests, whether the hospital is accredited or not. So basically make that decision 
empower the consumer to choose with the information. Otherwise, it's like a black box. You just tell them this is comprehensive, but it doesn't mean anything. And after that, integrate back to the booking. And what we do right now, we also have the analytics portion with all the corporate clients. So we know all the health-seeking behavior of all the employees, what type of doctor they see, how frequent they see, and what is the cost of consuming the healthcare costs and versus the budget given. So a lot of companies may say, for example, company A, my senior executive are given 100,000 budget. Company B, say 80,000. Just because you say 100,000 doesn't mean the guy will consume up to 100,000. Just because it's 80,000 doesn't mean that the, guy, the other company employee will use up to 80,000. So we have all this analytics behind and we can share that with the company. And with that, they can make a better informed decision how to monitor the employee and also how to manage the cost and negotiate with the insurance and also improving the productivity of the employees. So in all of this, what's the role of the government? What's your relationship with the government? I think we are, we are quite fortunate right now. We already got endorsement by the Ministry of Health that we're not an illegal operator. For example, in Malaysia, we are also got the endorsement last week from the Ministry of Tourism that they're pushing us as an official platform for, medic, for tourists. And uh, next month, we are launching with the Social Security of Malaysia. So they're also using us as the official platform for medical-related services. And we are very confident to replicate the same strategy in every country we go to because I believe healthcare is an extremely regulated business, not unlike all the other businesses because you're dealing with people's life. So anything happen, you'll be sued. Once you're sued, your company can go down to the drain. So what we do is we have to make sure we cover our ass, so to speak. And also we put together a good team of advisors consisting of regulators and policy makers. So for example, in Malaysia, I have three director general of health who sits on Ministry of Health. They are also holding position in WHO, UN for Healthcare. In Singapore, I have the chairman of Sing Health uh, as my advisor for Singapore. So every country we go, like the next one, we're going to Thailand. There's a very famous hospital called Bang Mun Rat for medical tourism. So the group managing director of the doctor group, he's currently the chairman of the medical council, will be our local advisor in Thailand. So there are a lot of nuances, you know, in healthcare that is not the same for every country and we need to adopt to the local regulation. Right, and Southeast Asia is inherently a pretty diverse place with, you know, lots of different variety. Mm. What what are some of your comments on that as a marketplace as a whole, that region? I think, of course, you mentioned the, the thinking, the culture, the languages. Even in healthcare, I can share with you, in Malaysia, in Ministry of Health, they classify what you call specialists. There are 86 types of specialists in Malaysia alone. You go to Hong Kong, there are 68 types of medical specialists. You go to Singapore, there's 48 types of specialists they were classified. So we have to adopt to every country and or not only that, the languages. I mean, the whole thinking, even a booking platform to start with, people are not used to booking. You go to the West, you go to Australia, Europe, America, people are used to booking. So that's why we're working with the government to sort of help transform. And with this, you can optimize the human capital because they talk about doctor to patient ratio of population is already very low in the developing country, a ratio of one to say, 1.3 versus what is recommended by WHO is 1 to 3, 1 to 3. Then you mentioned, but is it the effective 1 to 1? It's not. So with this, we hope to help optimize the care and improve transparency in healthcare. All right. Thank you so much. You're clearly an expert on healthcare, and I hope to hear more news from you guys Thank soon. You. And I can say he's very persistent too, which is one of the reasons he's on stage now, because he kept after Ying Ying and I for this uh, nomination and so many emails that we had to put him on stage. So thank you, Ying Ying, and thank you, Chevy. Thank you.